welcome to today's research and innovations um, update coming from uh, myself and the team that I'm working on. Just a brief uh, background. Um, I'm looking at uh, women empowerment, uh, but in the context of Malawi, trying to um, understand any relationships that exist uh, between uh, women empowerment, crop diversification, household nutrition, and being a member of uh, farmer field business schools. So just a brief outline of my presentation today. I know it's showing a lot of slides, but I promise they are mostly just pictures. So um, anyway, um, today I will be sharing mainly my presentation will focus on the field work that we just um, completed on uh, 2nd April. So that would be last week Tuesday, that's when we finished the uh, data collection and some preliminary um, reflections from there. Uh, so just taking you back a little bit to where we are coming from, um, just like um, anybody else, we started out with um, evidence synthesis that uh, tried to um, understand women empowerment and issues are research around women empowerment and some of the main takeaways from the evidence synthesis that um, we got pertaining to uh, my focus um, in this case was the relevance that women play when it comes to production and household nutrition um, but also the um, the importance that is there for women empowerment in the uh, development uh, spaces and taking advantage of um, taking advantage of uh, the partnerships and also the expertise within um, foster health uh, i set out to explore women empowerment within the context of um, titukulani titukulani is a program that's uh, implemented by one of the partners um, care uh, so they work with um, uh, participants, giving them interventions on women empowerment, nutrition, and also teaching them, uh, I think, different aspects on capacity building around um, farming through the farmer field business schools. Um, so when we set out to uh, do this research, we also came up with the understanding as well of the variation in the definition of what women empowerment is and also the challenges that are there in defining what women empowerment is, especially because of the need to co um, to compare across uh, different contexts, across different um, um, groups on the level or the status of uh, women empowerment, maybe before uh, project intervention and after or along uh, the way or also over time. But the cross-sectional data that's mostly available presents challenges because women empowerment are trying to look at, um, has there been um, like an increase or an improvement in, the, in women empowerment? So how do you, do, we, do you measure that? So that's where we are coming from when we were uh, conceptualizing around uh, the research questions for uh, for this research. So just to share briefly on the research, the main research questions. So the first one is um, uh, we're trying to establish, like I've said, uh, the, to understand uh, the relationship between women empowerment, crop diversification, nutritional outcomes, and farmer field business schools. But particularly, we are trying to see whether uh, being a member of farmer field business school promotes women empowerment and whether it leads to better nutritional outcomes, sort of like the underlying assumptions and the relationships that are there between farmer field business schools and crop diversification, farmer field business schools and nutrition. And secondly, uh, the second question is how is decision making understood and approached within women empowerment practice and what are the leverage points for agriculture transformation. Um, there we acknowledge the relevance that decision making takes even though uh, we are coming from the challenges of measuring empowerment. Uh, but looking at the different frameworks or analytical uh, frameworks that are presented when it comes to women empowerment, decision making is one of the common factors that is there. And uh, lastly, what are the individual and community aspirations of change in regard to food systems transformation? Here I should mention uh, that um, 
my work integrates um, Shea's Globe's uh, work on uh, aspirations and uh, women empowerment, as well as food systems transformation. So um, uh, this part of the question is more linked uh, with the Shea's Globe uh, team as well as myself. And also I should mention on set that uh, the research questions that you're seeing for Malawi are also mirrored uh, for Tanzania. And we did that on purpose to allow um, comparison at analysis stage. And most of our methods as well are also uh, related. So without taking much time with, uh, with the background, I want to dive in into the data collection. So when, when we were um, coming up with the uh, data collection plan, we explored um, using focus group discussions, using some structured interviews, using um, oral life histories, and also photo voice to come in as the gap, especially the idea of photo voice. We, we opted for that more uh, along uh, the development process of the research plan because of um, some of the challenges that we are there on set when it comes to women empowerment in the context for Malawi, there is no single word that represents women empowerment. So when we were trying to under, when we we're trying to come up with a question of okay, what is women empowerment? How do you say that in Chichewa? Already we were facing um, sort of like shortages with uh, with language. So to try and uh, beef up or to cover up for that gap as well, uh, photo voice was um, a welcome option to the uh, data plan that we had. So like I've said that we focused on um, uh, Titukulane project that is being implemented by Kea Malawi in Mangosh and Zomba. So our target audience was for the participants and non-participants of Titukulane. So those that were uh, particularly members of the pharma food business schools and those that were not receiving any form of uh, interventions from uh, Titukulane as well. So when it comes to field work, uh, planning something that I um, want to include as part of uh, my presentation today is to just uh, appreciate uh, the opportunities that we are there from working with different partners as foster health is. For instance, having um, Kea Malawi as part of the research um, team as well, we got uh, support in terms of um, uh, direction and uh, the planning, the field work planning as well. Uh, we were working, I was working hand in hand with um, Anthony on this and uh, Caitlin. And also apart from the inputs in terms of uh, data, um, in terms of developing the data collection instrument, they also supported um, the field work with uh, logistics. So around organizing uh, focus group discussions, uh, where we should go, when we should go, uh, this was really uh, done by Ikea Malawi and it made the whole process of data collection much more easier, so much that we were able to reach out to a lot more participants than I think we would have if it was just, I think, University of Leeds. And also, I think the support uh, for vehicle, fuel, and driver also allowed us to work with a much larger team of data collectors does, um, other than just myself and Anthony and a few other researchers. And we also received support from uh, MAST, Malawi um, University of Science and Technology. They provided us with research assistance as well. And this was a welcome addition to the team because it allowed us to conduct focus group discussions at the same time we are doing some structured interviews or oral like histories, which I'll talk about later on, that was uh, much longer than any other. So it allowed us to get on, started on the oral life histories while we are doing the focus group discussions as well. So moving forward, um, we had set out to do, we identified, uh, we we're going to uh, collect data in Mango Chain Zomba and um, the target areas where the intervention, intervention area, which is uh, where the participants were um, uh, we are participants of Titukulane and members of the Pharma Food Business Schools, and also the control area where you have participants that were not um, 
receiving any sort of um, interventions from Titukulani. So we set out to do 12 focus group discussions, uh, but when we went, that was just, um, that was just the plan, but the idea was uh, to stop the focus group discussions at data saturation and also resources um, allowing, of course. So we managed to do 26 focus group, a total of 26 focus group discussions um, for uh, primarily the intervention group and then the control group 12 and 14 for the focus group discussions. So just to share some um, preliminary reflections, I'm not going to go into details in terms of the data analysis because right now we're in the process of transcribing the, the data and also because we were working with uh, different, yes, pharmaceutical business schools. So because we were working with the uh, uh, it was a team of um, about six researchers as well. So here I'll just uh, share some preliminary reflections uh, following, you know, just coming from the field. So by doing the focus group discussions, it, it helps in um, bringing to light how relations and power relations within women households or communities and environmental factors such as social norms influence participants' individual choices. Particularly through the focus group discussions, I think we were, it was an opportunity to appreciate how the different groups uh, were influenced by, the, by their peers within the group um, on the questions around, okay, who makes decisions, for instance, um, who makes decisions around um, cooking um, in your home or what? Uh, who makes decisions around what crops you get to grow. We, we got to see diversion, uh, differences in how um, men and women responded to this while taking it into consideration the relationships that exist between them and also the social context within which they um within which uh, they live. And also issues about marriage uh, seems to come up a lot, especially when you're having, uh, when you're having focus groups, or when you're having contributions from married women participants. So the focus groups were separated, men and women were, uh, they were done separately, uh, but we didn't separate married and unmarried. So you, you, we got uh, through the focus group discussions, we got to appreciate the differences in the dynamics around uh, the issues that we were looking at, for example, control of resources by an unmarried participant and a married participant. And also something that was very interesting was some of the responses that we were getting from married participants, for example, they'll say, oh yeah, we do that together. But then, um, because they are sitting within their, their their peers, some that are not married, they'll come on and say, oh, okay, no, that's not really true. That's not really what you say from time to time. It is your husband that get to make those decisions. And I think that gave us a chance to go beyond just what um, a one-on-one -on -one interview would have gone with to, to, to say, okay, this is how we do it without any uh, having any uh, maybe counter arguments or some um, some conflicting opinions arising from the, uh, maybe based on the relationships that exist amongst the participants or even the social norms or even religious expectations in Mangochi, it's uh, most, mostly a Muslim community. And it's mostly a Muslim community, and we also got to differentiate with Zomba how the role as a husband, uh, uh, the, the sort of authority that a husband gets to have in such a context where religion puts uh, a, a man with uh, more power and authority compared to uh, Zomba where women would say, well, I own the piece of land, so therefore I say what happens, while the other side, it was a different uh, thing. So in terms of just uh, a, a practical thing that I would share concerning uh, this um, is, by the time we were halfway through the uh, the focus group discussions, uh, the data collection, all the researchers that were there could tell that, oh, okay, we get it's different facilitating a focus group from um, non- Titukulani participants 
end to Tukulani participants, the sort of like uh, difficulties in understanding of what women empowerment is in what, what sort of um, uh, joint decision making, the expectation of joint decision making is for non-participants, those that were not part of the uh, pharmacy business schools, for example, compared to the other group. So, like I said, that uh, focus group discussions were just the starting um, uh, tool that we use, but we also use some structured interviews. And for some structured interviews, we were targeting to get at least uh, 24 initially, but then when MAS provided us with uh, two more research assistants, it gave us an opportunity to um, have more one-on-one -on -one interviews with the participants within the uh, within the same time. I must mention that um, our aim whenever we go in the field in the morning was to make sure that our interviews, we don't get to keep the farmers for longer than uh, two hours so that we get to, re to release them back to their uh, daily activities and also because they weren't really monetary compositions that we were giving to them. So having a slightly larger team of research assistants was an opportunity to have um, um, more um, interactions, more interviews with the uh, with the uh, with the participants. So, in terms of the just uh, the reflections coming from the semi structured interviews, when when we when we are talking, uh, for instance, questions around crop diversification. It, it, you, 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 one would get a sense that, okay, crop diversification is the in thing. Everyone is diversifying their crops. But you would not, there would be these notable differences that most for non, -particip for non participants for Titukulani, it would be diversification primarily for consumption. So growing ground nuts apart from maize, just so that they can make porridge with ground nuts, uh, with ground nut powder or they can have potatoes when uh, when they do not have maybe relish for lunch and they can use that. Well, for the Titukulani participants, you'd get a sense of, okay, yes, I want to meet my household nutritional goals or uh, food security, but apart from that, I also want to uh, market the surplus that I get because I know this time around, everybody's going to be looking for groundnut, uh, groundnut powder, so it is an opportunity for my household to get some extra income from that. And and apart from that, it was also um, notable as well in the term, uh, in terms of how the participants for Titukulane, when you are having um, uh, the interviews with them, they were more um, like they were they were in pursuit for opportunities for joint decision making, um, and I think this. When you when you go through the their storylines, you could pick it that it would come from their their interactions with uh, um, uh, farmer field business schools or their interactions with the different groups of Titukulane in the appreciation of uh, joint decision making, which was not so very much um, obvious for non participants. It was oh okay as as a wife, the husband makes the decision and nothing to pursue that. However, this also posed the challenge for us as researchers because we also got the sense that um, because they've gone through um, these, the, the training or the information around the advantages of joint decision making, the expectation was that that's what we wanted to hear, that they were actually doing that in their households without really uh, there for us as researchers to ascertain that, okay, is this um, joint decision making from uh, the knowledge they have acquired through the project interventions, or is this something that has been embraced or adopted by themselves? Um, then another um, uh, another data collection method that we also use was the life um, oral life histories. As I've said, one of the question, uh, one of our research questions looks at uh, the aspirations. Here we were um, tracking the aspirations, the life history from childhood uh, all the way to adulthood. And uh, we targeted to do at least 20 interviews for both Zomba and Mangochi, but um, we managed to um, do a little bit uh, more than that as well, uh, which was um, 
a good uh, a good thing. So just some of the preliminary reflections on on this. Most of the participants that we were um, interviewing for this for both groups, uh, Tutukulani and Tutukulani, the ideas around aspirations, uh, future goals. They, they are not so much part of their stories per se, and it it meant the um, the, the the questioning or uh, going through the questionnaire much more longer in trying to elaborate in trying to probe what you're trying to get uh, with each question that was asked. Um, however, we even though the the questionnaire was long, and I think all of us were conscious of that. That okay, we are going to sit with you for about one hour, 30 minutes, or for about two hours. Uh, it was interesting to see the enthusiasm from, from the participants as well, uh, especially towards the end for them to, um, we're getting uh, feedback like, okay, this is the first time I've sat through uh, looking back at who I wanted to be when I was younger to what I am right now. And it's giving me questions around, okay, how can I either um, aspire for what I wanted to be back then. Is it too late, or what? Uh, what sort of steps I can take now? And we gave them the option to take uh, the. We were producing. I've uh, shared a picture there. Um, a their life story, uh, their timeline. We gave them the option that if they wanted to take it, they would. And most of them opted to take it, but others were just happy to just have uh, a picture of them uh, taken with it, and just. Uh, to share uh, quickly on that, um, most of the childhood aspirations were related to uh, who they were exposed to. For example, they wanted to be a teacher or a nurse or a doctor because that's what they saw or that's who, that's the most educated they have been exposed to and didn't want to aspire for their homes, uh, for their families. Uh, livelihoods, for example, farming, but almost a majority of them always, uh, the aspiration always ends up going to uh, them uh, having a uh, farming farm, farming livelihoods as, as, they are, as they are homes. Um, so in terms of um, photo voice, so for photo voice, these, these data collection methods, they are linked, would have the focus group discussion, would have about um, 10 to 12 people. And then from there, we'll select those that will uh, interview for the same structured interview. And then from the same 12, we'll pick out those that will sit down to have the oral life histories with, as well as from the same uh, focus group, uh, but uh, participants and also those that have been, those that we have sat down to do the oral life histories with, we would then, um, select participants for the photo voice. So here um, I've just uh, shared one of uh, the settings that we were uh, using for the for the photo voice, where we give the farmers uh, smartphones and ask them the, the first the first thing that we did was to just ask them that okay um, after the trainings and everything go back to your communities and just take um, five pictures of things that you find interesting or things that you admire or things that um, inspire you, um, anything to that effect. So that started out our um, photo voice and it was participatory in terms of, okay, what sort of uh, themes we want to explore when we want to, when they, when they come back, we, we talk through them, would um, encourage them to here I've just shared some of the pictures that came back um, around um, aspirations they wanted to uh, build houses some of them wanted to have businesses within their homes others wanted to um, diversify from crops to um, to livestock um, so we went, we did uh, four sessions with each group. So we would have a session on a Monday and then they'll have about seven days to go back and collect um, more photos and then send them to the research assistants. And then when we we'll meet again, 
we will um, show the pictures on the screen and then have each one of them uh, tell a story around uh, the picture they have shared, why they selected it and what inspired them. And then we would have a discussion as a group. While another member will be uh, taking down the themes that are coming, the, the main points that are coming out as I've shared in the picture um, here. So they were as much hands-on um, as as we could possibly uh, make it for them. And um, after this, uh, after the four sessions, we also talked about having an exhibition where they get uh, where they get to share the pictures because most of the farmers, when they got the phones and went back to their communities, some of them brought the whole community together to say, okay, we have received these phones, we are involved in uh, uh, working on uh, this research with uh, with Foster Health and Titukulani, this is what we are doing. If you see us taking pictures, uh, um, don't have questions or don't wonder what we are doing. So with um, from the discussions, we felt that an and a community exhibition would be a chance for them to go back and show that, okay, these are the pictures that we were taking, these are the issues that we have discussed, and also to get uh, input uh, from the communities that they were taking pictures from. So here is just uh, an example of uh, um, an exhibition. I think in one of the pictures you can see Anthony there opening the, the sessions. I think it's Anthony or one of the participants, I really can't see clearly from here but um this was planned by themselves they decided who they wanted to invite it was all up to them uh how they wanted to go through the process of uh, sharing the insights from the photos and interacting with the community everything was done by them um and because we could not inject the kind of capital um, think of uh, the smartphones that we were using because we could not in, uh, inject that uh, sort of asset within their communities. We had to withdraw the phones and this was made clear from the beginning that the phones would be withdrawn, but we asked them what uh, they would want instead. For example, whether they would want uh, to have their um, professional pictures taken with their families or anything else. And for both groups, they opted for t-shirts, which you can see uh, we had them made uh, with any picture of their choice that they had taken themselves or that meant something to them. So here are the two groups. We had uh, two groups of participants and non-participants uh, that um, had both men and women in there. So these are the two groups and with the two groups as well, they all have their own uh, separate exhibition within their communities to share with the groups what they were working on. Now, like I said earlier on that, one of the challenges that we were having in doing the the one-on-one -on -one interviews or the, the questions was it was it was still a bit difficult to ascertain exactly where their knowledge and practice where we are at for the participants in terms of issues around decision making at household level and also consumption patterns at household level uh, amongst both the Titukulani and non Titukulani participants. So while in the uh, field from the discussions and deliberations with the team, uh, we decided to come up with what um, we call participatory household budget negotiations. Here we tried to put the participants in a, in a, um, in a scenario where they are trying to come up with a household budget um, for their for their home, even though they were doing it in a group. So men on their own during uh, trying to understand, okay, what do you eat during lean periods, like the time that we were collecting the data where there was limited food available, and uh, what do you eat when you have harvested, when you have more um, within your household. So we put them in, uh, two groups, men on their own, women on their own, and to come up with two different budgets for the lean period and the, um, the abundance period. So as the research team, we are focused on um, observing our roles to just observe uh, the sort of negotiations that they went into amongst themselves. How are they deciding on what to put on that budget and what not to put on that budget? Our considerations of nutrition part of it, uh, how do power, how are power dynamics playing out from those people that are uh, maybe uh, have a 
a higher position than the others, and then would ob um, observe this and then bring the team together and try to have the men and women negotiate the budget. Um, so it was interesting to see um, how uh, men would make provisions for women to get away with, you know, putting, uh, for example, if you say, okay, during abundance, we would eat, um, for example, beef, yeah, we would eat beef. And for men, you'd have during abundance, they've put pumpkins, maybe two pumpkins each, because it's the time for abundance. Not so much concerned with the, uh, the traditional organizations of food that we eat in Sima and relish, but just thinking of what is available now. And these are some of the things that were observed in, uh, we had, uh, we managed to do uh, four of these observations. And it was interesting to see how women were more aligned to uh, the traditional way of eating in Malawi, where you have a carbohydrate and a protein. So on Sima and something else. Well, for men, they seemed more relaxed around that and would think, okay, during harvest, we have more pumpkins, we have more potatoes, so let's eat that for dinner and then that's it. Um, so in terms of um, reflections on, on here, here I've just uh, shared some of the process that we were going through in terms of uh, the participatory house of decision making here women sitting together trying to negotiate what goes on their budget and here men doing the same and then in the next picture you will see them presenting their budgets and then working um trying to you know um argue it out or battle it out that no we need to have beans there or no we need to have dry fish there instead and um in the end as well we would give them um would give them the amount that uh, they had come up with for either of the budgets. Lucky enough for even the uh, the most abundant budget, I think the most they would come up with would be something like maybe 30 pounds or 40 pounds equivalent. So it was it was still um, within um, affordable for, uh, for us to do that. And then we'd come in to see the actual cooking, like the actual cooking to say, okay, who is really doing the cooking? Who is involved in this? Because when we sit down to ask them questions around that, what they would say is, oh yeah, no, I, uh, we, we cook together. Me and my husband, yes, we, 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 we cook together. Okay, how do you decide what to eat at the house? Okay, we do it together me and my husband. But when we sit through these negotiations and discussions, women will say, no, men don't, don't even know how much that costs. Men don't even know how much firewood, for example, I need. They don't even know how much cooking oil we need at a house spot. And it was um, interesting uh, to see these observations and the nuances in some of the arguments that we never could have had access or we never would have been able um, to hear. So just uh, some reflections. When you look at the literature around uh, food preparation, is food choices reinforces women's prescribed roles uh, and that making choices in these domains does not indicate any degree of empowerment, which can be um, argued as such. But at the same time, we saw this as an opportunity to see how does a how does a woman position herself in a context where she is empowered. So if it is her space, if the kitchen is her space, if issues are, if decisions around food is her space, how does she position herself? Her, herself? So here we got to see how um how women were more in charge as in okay how much salt is going to go in there how is uh how are you cutting this how are we organizing this how are we organizing this and also we got to appreciate the the value that men put when it comes to knowledge uh, that women have, because in the arguments that uh, were happening, you'd have men, oh, okay, let let them, they'll all have dry fish, for example, but they'll say, oh, okay, because women, they know better. So let the option that's coming from women go through and uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that because they know better. So things, uh, things opportunities like this to see what uh, 
knowledge and experience, how we can leverage knowledge and experience as a way of um, improving or positioning women to be more decision makers. I think it was um, a great thing to, uh, to observe and experience. And also it unraveled how control of resources, a simple change of hands of money, when women are given just the money for to buy uh, food for the household, they express issues around, oh, okay, we save the money, we take the money to village and savings loan so that we are part of the group, so that we are maintained in the groups that we are part of, in the groups where uh, we feel um, we enjoy spending more, uh, more of our time with. And it was a surprising finding for, for the men. They were like, you you said the, the money was not enough or um, it was just enough for the day. How did you manage to take some away to put towards the village and savings um, loans that you belong to? Which also brought in questions around, okay, how do these social groups that women uh, belong to or they feel as uh, part of, how do they play towards the nutrition of household? Uh, they are compromising, for example, buying um, chicken, to uh, just buying, for example, dry fish because the balance is what needs to go to the group. And these where substitutes are not found within, for example, proteins or carbohydrates, how do these play out in the end when it comes to household nutrition and, and all that? So anyway, I can talk on and on and on, but um, just to keep it short, we thought this was... Um, a very positive way of interacting with the participants, especially when we're looking at, as foster health, we're trying to understand, okay, how do we give back to the communities that we are getting this data from? And we felt that this was one of well, an activity that gave us a chance to, the time that we are collecting this data, they, they were like, uh, most of the households were, um, uh, did not have enough food uh, within their households. And by doing this activity, we were getting rich data from the observations, from the activities that were happening. But by the end of that, we also gave them an opportunity to sit down and have, I think, their own kind of celebration where they get to cook and eat and uh, share with their families. And um, I think this was a much needed and more relevant way to actually give back, considering the context that we were collecting um, the data at. So what are the next steps? Having finished the data collection uh, on Tuesday uh, last week. Uh, the next steps are uh, data analysis uh, for myself and my team. So currently we have, as you have seen, we have so different forms of data, audios, videos, we have pictures um, that um, we are trying to systematically uh, label and categorize. And we have studied transcription. And um, after the, uh, the transcription, the hope is that we're going to go through the data analysis uh, plan that I have just shared um, roughly here into the data familiarization and also trying to um, see uh, who, um, how as a team uh, between the researchers that are working on this, how we are going to uh, handle the data analysis, uh, the coding and the theme development all the way through. So um, currently, um, have a draft version of my data analysis plan, but this is yet to be shared with uh, my PI, Steven. We need to um, go through that, share, um, have a chat through that, and also consider the data that we have, and then we work um, on this to finalize this data analysis plan with uh, the care team as our co-lead. So that's what I had for you today. Uh, thank you.